America in New York last month. Joan Hoffmeister, why do we hate the oil companies? In a simple sentence, because the government has taught us to hate oil companies. How so? Because we do not have an energy policy or an energy strategy for our nation. Every time something goes wrong, prices go too high, profits seem excessive, shortages happen. After hurricanes, for example, the oil companies are always blamed for whatever has gone wrong with how they operate to service the American people. When the reality is, without an energy policy, without an energy strategy, which the government has failed to create over decades of both Republican and Democratic administrations, which Congress has failed to establish, we simply do not have the ability to supply ourselves with sufficient energy that the economy needs. And it's getting worse, not better. So rather than take responsibility themselves, the government points the finger at the energy companies, whether it's the oil companies or the utilities or the coal companies, and blames them for when everything, when things don't go well. Well, there are politicians who use the phrase big oil and talk about some of the mistakes that the oil companies have made in the past. Doesn't the oil doesn't the oil industry have some role in, in, in the feeling, the negative feelings towards it? Absolutely. And I'm just as critical of the industry in the book. The industry does two things miserably wrong. One is they choose to live in political purgatory because they tend to favor one party over the other. When that party is out of power, they are living in political purgatory because they don't have the relationships with that other party. The second thing that they do wrong is they live behind a wall of silence. That wall of silence prevents the American people or even elected officials from knowing what do they think? What do they know? How do they make decisions? Are their decisions honest, transparent decisions? Or are they greedy, nasty decisions made in their own self-interest? I've been there. I was part of the decision-making process. I decided to take my leadership agenda public. I went all over the country when the oil prices were hitting hundred dollars a barrel and higher. I went to 50 US cities with 250 managers of my company to explain to people to listen. Yes, president of Shell Oil Company. And I listened to people all over the country what they thought, took ideas under consideration explain why the high gas prices, why the high crude oil prices. I was ultimately joined by another company, ConocoPhillips did something similar, but by and large the industry has had a hands-off relationship with the public which feeds this negative impression. So if you have elected officials who are speaking pejoratively about big oil, big coal, uh, the big utilities, and you have the public not well informed, you get a terrific combination for why we would hate these people. In two or three sentences, why is it that in the time of high record oil prices, oil companies made record profits? They made the record profits off the crude oil that they produced, not off the gasoline that they sold. The gasoline price is a reflection of the cost of crude oil that goes into the making of the gasoline, but the actual margin is very low for retail products. The margin on crude oil is a different matter altogether. So, for example, an oil field that's 20, 30 years old, where all the costs have been depreciated, but you're still producing oil, the cost to produce that oil might be in the range of, of even single digits or low double digits from six to maybe fifteen dollars but if the crude price is eighty five then you're making a lot of money off of that old oil now new crude new wells new fields you could well be having costs of sixty five or seventy five dollars a barrel and you're selling it for eighty five dollars a barrel so you're making almost nothing so it's that combination of old and new oil a significant profitability but even if you average it out average the profits against the revenue it's really on a US basis 
average profitability of around six to eight percent of total sales. John Hoffmeister, when you hear the term energy independence for the U.S., what do you say? I say that it's wishful thinking. If we were to ever be energy independent, it would be because we have a short, medium, and long-term plan that is executed over a 50-year time frame that creates independence as an outcome of that plan. Richard Nixon was the first president to promote energy independence. He's the first president who ever used those two words together. In those days, when Nixon was president, we imported 30% of our oil. Eight presidents later, 18 congresses later, all of whom promised the American people energy independence, last year we imported 65% of our oil. We've gotten worse, not better. So all the political pledging, all the political promising that has happened since Richard Nixon, including the current president, including his predecessor, has all been political hypocrisy. And I think that needs to be understood by the American people. But we have coal, we have natural gas, we have solar, we have et cetera, nuclear. We actually have more energy than we will ever need, ever, in this country. But government policy prevents us from producing what we could otherwise produce. Example, drilling is in everybody's front of mind at the moment because of the blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, a horrific incident. After 35,000 wells were saved, and it's a horrific incident. It has to be stopped. It has to be cleaned up. Having said that, we have to ask the question, why are we in the deep water to begin with? We're in the deep water taking all that risk, all that high cost, because government policy prevents drilling in shallow water in 85% of the uh, American coast, the Outer Continental Shelf. And it prevents drilling on federal land. We could be drilling onshore, we could be drilling in the shallow offshore, which is much safer, except government policy won't allow it. We could be mining more coal, but government policy doesn't allow it. We could be building more nuclear plants. We could be storing nuclear waste. Government policy doesn't allow it. So my point is, we are rationing energy when we need more energy, and we are disinvesting in old forms of energy by making it ever more difficult to produce more traditional energy, and we're headed for an energy abyss in this country based on government policy. 35,000 offshore oil rigs, correct? Wells. Wells. 35,000 wells have been drilled in the Gulf of Mexico. How many are currently operating? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but m not all of them, but quite a few of them. If you were the president of Shell Oil and this was your situation, would you be handling it like Tony Hayward and BP are right now? Probably. Why? The first and highest priority is to stop the flow of the well at the bottom of the sea. All of the best ideas in the industry, not just BP, but the industry and from outside the industry are being considered in the crisis room. Every imaginable step that could be taken to shut off that flow is or has been considered. The engineering work that is being done to implement each and every one of the possibilities of either channeling the flow or stopping the flow is being done, it's being developed. You have to go through a methodical checklist approach on each and every possible way to stop the flow. This is unprecedented. This has never happened at 5,000 feet of water. So the difficulty of doing the, of doing the shutoff is seriously problematic. I might do the, I would do the uh, remedial environmental protection very differently than what's being done. I've been talking about the idea, which I got from an engineer who has experience in this area, of bringing super tankers into the Gulf to suck the oil off the sea. If you clean the oil off the top of the ocean, it wouldn't wash on shore. You have 50 miles from the well to the beaches and the marshes. I believe you could put an intervention in place.